Well, good morning. It's been several weeks, and I appreciate so much Brother Miller and Brother Shope uh, being able to continue their classes to where we've been able to diversify and still have classes and still have a children's program. And uh, uh, But I'm anxious for us all to be in this building to where we're all preparing for the same day at the same time to be able to do what we do for the honor and glory of the Lord, the edification of the church, and uh, what, a, what a privilege it is. Uh, I'm going to diverse just a little bit. I'm almost done with our statement of faith. I've got a couple more lessons I want to teach. I'm praying about starting the book of James. Uh, I think it's relative to our day. And uh, honestly, I don't know that I've ever taught through the book of James. Uh, I was uh, be leaning toward the book of Jude. I've taught through Jude, and I have some good lesson plans on Jude. Uh, Jude, but I, I, I believe the Lord had me go to the book of James. It has application to authority, to position in the local church. It has to do with uh, us reaching out, control of our flesh, putting in action all the things we've been talking about on Wednesday nights and many of our Sunday nights. So if you'd pray with me about that, I'm not settled on it yet, and that could change. I still have a couple of weeks that I'm going to be working on this. But this morning, and I may let this carry over to... Uh, to Resurrection Sunday, Easter, I'm not sure yet. But I thought it would be good for me to go ahead and jump ahead one lesson and uh, deal with something that should be dear to any born-again Christian's life and heart, and that's the subject of heaven. And then I'm going to try and contrast heaven and hell and then deal with hell. Um, I, think, I think it would behoove us. It's a good, good time for us as Christians as we're getting back in in church here at Lighthouse, uh, to remember that this time we spend on this earth uh, is very limited. And ultimately, our, our hope and our goal is to please the Lord and be able to rejoice with Him and glorify His name and fellowship with Him and the brethren throughout eternity. And uh, I don't know that I'll say anything that may be new to you that have been saved for a long time. But I believe anytime we open the Word of God, God can show us things and define things. And, and it seems like I get in conversations with folks all the time about their, uh, about their relationship with Jesus Christ or about eternity or about the doctrines that we've been dealing with. And, and I'll hear something said and I'll think, well, you know, that's not really biblical, or I've been confronted with saying things and, and come to find out that I'm, I'm just not quite all the way online. And so I think it's good for us to do it. Uh, as we said, we're going to start with heaven this morning. First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, what a blessing it is for, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard. Now, you know, we get used to quoting that, but why is the ear so important? Uh, what we see with our eyes, we see constantly the depravity around us. Uh, actually, this morning, this is Friday morning, I'm, pre I'm teaching for Sunday morning, and uh, I think it's supposed to be 70, 71 degrees today, and the wind's supposed to pick up, but it's absolutely beautiful outside, and I can see the, gr uh, the green grass coming up through the brown, and, and so uh, we see spring coming, and that's a uh, part of the promise of God and the seasons that God gives us, he says, but as it's written, I have not seen. And I think oftentimes we think about what we see with our eyes and how that one of these days we're going to see our loved ones, we're going to see those that we served with throughout the years, those that had influences our life spiritually, emotionally, physically, uh, that are saved and born again. And then we're going to, of course, see our Savior. We're going to see the majesty of the throne. And we talk about what we're going to see oftentimes, but it says, I have not seen nor ear heard. So what's going to be so much different? When I left Baltimore, uh, I lived in a part of Baltimore that there was actually only two main roads that went out of the section where I lived. There was over 100,000 people. And so they had these two roads. So any uh, ambulance, any fire truck, anything that was going to travel into the city or from the city out to, to where we lived, uh, they, they had to drive up German Hill Road or uh, out Mayor Boulevard. And I actually got used to uh, hearing the ambulances and the roar of the city all the time. I got used to it. Uh, I could go to sleep with all that racket going on. I moved here to West Virginia and, and uh, 
you that have been out to our place, uh, you know the way I sit and where I sit. Uh, for the longest time, my wife and I couldn't go to sleep. I mean, to just hear night birds and to hear owls and whippoorwills and uh, to be able to listen to the wind going through the trees, it was too quiet for me. I had a while to get used to it. I want you to know something. When we get to heaven, there's going to be a familiarity from what we hear. I, if I can illustrate it with Christmas, I think Christmas is a good illustration because we have Christmas sounds we think of, of caroling, family singing. We think of laughter and children. We think of programs, even in the local church. There's so many things that become very comforting, that comforts our souls. When we get to heaven, the sound, not just what we see, but the sound is going to be familiar, yet I don't know how to describe it. We could go through scriptures and look, and it would be fun to do. Maybe we will sometime. But as is written, I have not seen or ear heard. Neither hath entered into the heart of man. That's what I'm talking about. It's, it's emotional. Uh, it's intellectual. I, I, think it, I think it's going to do something to the glorified soul and body of us that uh, we're going to, listen, we're going to get fine-tuned. And uh, the defilement will be gone. Neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. The preparation of God. When, uh, when I took church a couple years ago, my wife was gone all that summer. Uh, when I knew that she was going to be coming into town, uh, I made an effort to get the house in something similar to what she would do. Now, her idea and my idea was different. But I can't imagine what God's doing for us right now. Don't you think it's good for us to talk about these things right now? I, just, I think it's good. It's our eternal home. Uh, we have people move here. They, from house to house, they build. Families grow. They have to enlarge house or buy another house. As they get older, they downsize. and Ultimately, you know, Everything here requires maintenance. There's not going to be maintenance there. Uh, I'll never have to worry about cleaning out gutters or painting again or staining again or, or fixing a deck or replacing a board or fixing the plumbing or replace, replace, replace. We're a throwaway society. No, heaven won't be that way. But as it is written, I have not seen or ear heard, neither have have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Conclusion that is to love the Lord. Those that are saved, those that are born again, those that have that relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to talk some about heaven. Right before I do, I wanted to talk just a second about a, a slight contrast and a perception today. Um, the Bible only gives two destinies. And uh, I can remember, and it's not been that many years ago. In fact, it was uh, probably right before we went into evangelism that uh, you saw more and more of it coming out, uh, even in uh, Hallmarks. You just, uh, you, you'd see a movie, you'd see something come out or a show that you thought would be wholesome, and they would deal with uh, destinies other than heaven and hell. In fact, how often do we hear hell preached on anymore? You know, the reality of hell uh, confirms the reality of heaven. Uh, there's only two destinies for mankind when we depart from this life. Uh, these destinies are heaven and hell. Uh, God didn't give us any other options. Uh, you search the scriptures through, scriptures through and through, and I assure you, uh, you will find no other destinations given for mankind other than eternity in God's presence or eternity separated from God. Uh, man in his depraved mind uh, oftentimes has come up with alternatives or adjustments to our destiny. Uh, something that we hear more and more today, and uh, 
you know, it's not just the atheist that say it, but most believe that the, there's, there's a destiny of man is to cease to exist. Uh, their idea is, is that we're like dogs, and we could take the time to go through a bunch of scriptures, and we're going to probably talk about several of these scriptures, but the scriptures makes it clear that, you know, God defines that there's a difference between the flesh of an animal, the flesh of a fish, and the flesh of a man. And that's just talking about the body. Uh, the idea is, is that I'm triune. I'm a body, soul, and spirit. Uh, my spirit was created to be eternal. From the time that I begin to exist, I will never cease to exist. And so the whole premise of a destiny of non-existence seems appealing to some people because their life is full of pain and sorrow. And God tells us that is true. So it seems rational to many that they're going to latch on because it requires no faith to just say, listen, we live, we laugh, we love, we we." Party through life, we do what we want to do, and then we cease to exist. So eat, drink, and be merry. And that's a lie from the, from the, the devil's hell. It's, it's, it's an untruth. I want you to understand something. No matter what happens in this life, no matter how you live this life, no matter how you just a life or take advantage of this life, this minute that I'm standing here right now, I will never get again. But... Once this life is over, I will spend eternity, that is forever, in a place called heaven where God is, or a place called hell where God is not, one or the other. Uh, years ago, when we moved to Cleveland, Ohio, and that's where we got saved, I was confronted. I knew nothing about Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism created a place called purgatory. It is not biblical. You cannot find it. It's, it's basically a place of suffering that you, once you die, your loved ones can continue to give and pay your way out of purgatory or out of that suffering so you could go on to heaven. Um, it's not in scriptures. You can't show it to me in scriptures. You want to give it a shot. I'm willing to listen. Do you believe that there's people that's Roman Catholic that's God saved? Absolutely. That's, I've lived in Roman Catholic towns the majority of my adult life. Uh, I, believe, I believe there's people uh, that's got saved, but once they get saved, they learn what doctrine is. And the doctrine of purgatory is not, not there. We have heaven and hell. We do not have a place of suffering that you, they hold you until you're bought out of so that you might be able to go on to heaven. Uh, something that we saw pop up 25 years ago, maybe a little longer than that. It started back in what I call the hippie days or the sexual revolution. We uh, were embracing much of the Eastern religion, and that is uh, the destiny of in reincarnation. Uh, reincarnation basically means that you don't cease to exist, but based on your, the way you live, your karma, your type of life that you, you live, it determines... Uh, what you will be in the next life, uh, whether you'll come back as another individual, will you be uh, better, will you be worse? Uh, if you've lived in total depravity, come back as a, you know, a beetle or a worm or a snake. Uh, they believe in reincarnation. Um, I've always appreciated men like uh, MacArthur and Patton uh, and their leadership ability in the Second World War, but uh, Patton, he leaned toward being reincarnated. He actually believed that that he was uh, that he was actually a Roman commander from Roman days, and he had been reincarnated. He had always been a warrior, always been a soldier. Uh, and there's just no scripture to back anything like that up. Uh, I have one life to live, and and to, and to many times. Many of the great preachers, they lived very short lives. But what they did for the Lord Jesus Christ was not determined by the days that they served, but by what they did in those days. So I, I thought it'd be good if I just took a moment and established the fact that we're, you, can, 
You can see all the things you can joke, you can make light of, but the, the world out here would much rather take, <coughs> excuse me, they would much rather take any other option than hell. And any other option than heaven. What do you mean? People don't want to go to heaven? People don't want, listen, people don't want to be told what to do. And salvation requires obedience. Once you're saved and born again, God wants you to do what he wants you to do, and people rebel against that principle, that thought. So they would rather embrace something else that allows them to live the way they want to live. This morning, I'd like to just, just a second look at a couple things, and then I'm going to actually get into the lesson, and I'll try to watch my time. I'll try to be sensitive to that. But uh, um, I'd like to notice just a couple of similarities. First of all, uh, both places are plainly and indisputably taught in the Bible. Uh, you won't see purgatory in the Bible, uh, but you will see heaven in the Bible, and you will see hell in the Bible. Uh, they're there. Both places are real. Uh, just so you understand, they're literal, and they're actual places. Uh, my grandfather, uh, grandmother, my, my dad's mom, uh, she spiritualized everything. And so uh, to her, uh, she spiritualized hell especially. Uh, she took it more on the consciousness of man is still literal, literal suffering. I want you to understand something. Hell is a literal place. My Bible tells me that hell is enlarging itself in the center of the earth. It's a place of torment. And, and so when the Bible tells us that there, it's real, it's literal, it's actual, the new Jerusalem will come down, we will go to a literal place where God dwells, and we will deal with it, and we're going to deal with it in just a little bit, the fact that we will have a body, and that body does function. Both places are eternal destinies for all the occupants of mankind. So, so you understand, you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. If you're listening this morning by way of uh, online services, by way of the internet, so you understand, I believe this is the infallible word of God. This old King James Version right here, I believe that it's the absolute authority of all things. And so if I believe that, this book tells me that there's a destiny for my eternal soul, the spirit that's in me that now has been awakened by God is going to spend eternity with the Lord, or it's going to spend eternity separated from the Lord, and that heaven and hell are real places, and everybody is going to go one or the, or the other. It doesn't matter what your choice. Your free will has nothing to do with that eternity outside of the fact that you have opportunity to choose the free gift of God. That's it. And so you understand, I do not believe in soul sleep. Uh, up where I live just recently, the... Uh, the uh, Kingdom Hall, the Jehovah Witnesses, they had taken the time during this COVID time where they're just like everybody else trying to figure out how to, to be able to minister to their people, to reach their communities. Uh, I received a handwritten letter. And, uh, and, and the doctrine that they tried to spew at me was the very doctrine that I'm dealing with right here is the fact that, uh, you know, when we go into eternity, there's a period in time that, that we're asleep, we're so asleep. No, uh -uh. no, in fact, I don't think we're ever more conscious than when we step from this life to the next life. As the veil was rent in two in the temple, so will the conscience of man when he enters eternity. He will have shed this flesh. Unless it comes by Jesus Christ coming back for the church, uh, this flesh will be shed for a period of time, and when it's shed for this period of time, we're going to be awakened in our conscience like we never were before. We're going to be aware of everything. And uh, whether it's in the torment of hell or whether it's in the uh, eternal abode of God. So there is some similarities. Uh, we're going to be eternally conscious in heaven or hell. And that everybody's going to go to one or the other place. And that the places are real places. And that the word of God backs up everything that I've just said. So let's get into it a little bit. Heaven. <coughs> <coughs> the very word whispers peace to our soul. 
This old troubled world has nothing for the child of God. This world does not bring me any peace. And it's never brought me any lasting joy. This world has never provided the type of fellowship that sustains me and gets me through the darkness of the nights. This world is nothing but sorrow and heartache and disappointment and ultimately death. I found out yesterday afternoon that uh, I call him Tucker, Tom Tennyson, and Linda and their families, members here, his, his mother, who he would bring for quite a spell there on Sunday nights and some Wednesday nights. Her and her husband worked up at Shenandoah Bible Baptist for years. Uh, that his mother had went on to be with the Lord. It's appointed unto men wants to die. I probably quote that as much as I quote salvation verses. I remind myself of it continually. Because we, we have this tendency to just go through this life living like we're never going to die. And when I know the reality that one of these days I'm going to be separated from this body and my work on this earth is done, then all that I could do or wanted to do for the Lord Jesus Christ has ended. As Christians today, amidst all the death and the disappointment and the heartache and the sorrow, I have a hope. I have an abounding hope. Is that not our theme for the year? I have an abounding hope. And as Christians today, would to God that we would uh, keep our eyes on the eternal goal. I think that God will bless us for us. Okay, what is heaven? What is heaven? Now, there's three heavens. They're described in the Bible. And I, I, I thought, well, you know, maybe I ought to clarify this because the Bible all, often talks about it. Uh, the first heaven, Genesis 1, 8, the Bible says, And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Verse 20 of the same chapter, of, uh, chapter 1 of Genesis, the Bible says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of the heaven. So the first heaven is this area that we have that we call atmosphere. It surrounds this earth. Now, so you know, if you get over there in the New Testament, and you even look at in, in Isaiah, you find out that this is also the habitat of Satan. Now, just so you know, he doesn't control it. God controls him. But this is where he labors and works because he understands that once the man has passed from this life to the next life, that his goals cannot be reached one way or the other. Man is either separated and goes to hell or goes to heaven. So the first point that we see here is that we have this firmament around us, this atmosphere, and I, won't, I don't need to get into it. Maybe we go back and look at it sometime, but that actually changed the way it was and where it was uh, once we had the flood and the destruction of the earth. It did, did change after that. That's why... Uh, we don't live as long. Uh, the, that's why we uh, actually receive more rays from the sun. And we know that the sun and many steads ages. And, uh, and we don't need to get all that. But that, that is one of the heavens. It's the heaven around us right here. The second heaven we see there in Genesis chapter 22, verse 17, says that <clears throat> in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Um, I don't know that man can even calculate the depth of the second heaven. Uh, we don't have a telescope that can reach beyond the galaxies uh, to where other suns are, and other moons, and other planets. Uh, it, it staggers my imagination. It shows me how limited my capability is of seeing afar off. Because in this second heaven is where uh, God placed the stars and the moon. Um, I, I have trouble sometimes, even in my faith, 
grasping the speck of the planet Earth and then coming down to God being concerned about this heart that beats in my breast. When God in his hand can hold all those galaxies and stars and planets. Yet he loves me. Very hard to wrap that around, isn't it? But that is the second heaven. Then the third heaven is the abode of God. Now, you got to be careful because God's omnipresent. So God can be on the throne in heaven and, and can be in the heart of Howard. God can do that. But that is the boat of God, and it is his seat of authority. Uh, I think it's very important for us as Christians uh, that if I'm going to define the heavens, that third heaven is the abode of God, and that's the place I'm going to go to. Uh, we're going to deal with it, absent from the body present with God. That's the, the, the thing that takes place, and we'll look at that in just a little bit. But what is heaven? Well, heaven is the abode of God. We have heavens. We have the uh, heaven of the, our atmosphere that's around our earth. We have the heavens, the second heaven, which uh, involves all the moon, stars, planets, suns. And then we have the abode of God, which is above that. And that's where God dwells. And uh, it's sufficient to say that. First Kings 8, 27, the Bible says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have builded. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant of thy people Israel. When they shall pray toward this place and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place. And when thou hearest forgive. I love letting my imagination go there. I love thinking about being in a, a tent in August. People are sitting under the word of God. A young teenage girl or a boy comes forward, gets on their knees, realizing God is creator of all things and gave his life and his son's life that, that we might have eternal life. And in that action, that child calls out to God and God hears that prayer through the first heaven, through the second heaven, to the very throne of God. You say, you believe that, preacher? If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be standing here this morning. I sure would not. I rejoice today in the fact that the first thing that God hears from Howard is save me. And God answers that prayer. God gives his spirit to me. What is heaven? Well, it's where God is. What's hell? It's where God's not. We have no relationship with God there. I want to take just a moment because I had this question asked to me. What is Zion? And uh, I thought, well, you know, I can, I can put a slide together on Zion. I can, I can deal with what Zion is. Uh, there's a lot of scriptures that deal with it. But it's another name for, first of all, Jerusalem. 2 Samuel 5, 7, the Bible says, Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. That's Jerusalem. Now, we have the physical city of Jerusalem called Zion. But it's kind of like what we see in the first heaven, second heaven, third heaven. Uh, the Jerusalem of the millennium is a little different. Isaiah 2, verse 2, the Bible says, It shall come to pass... In the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he shall judge among the nations, shall rebuke buke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's the Jerusalem of the millennium. We're going to have 
Jerusalem, and then the new Jerusalem is out of heaven. It's going to come between the, uh, the city of Jerusalem, physical city, the throne of David, to that throne which sets above. And that's where God's going to rule and reign during the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we think of Zion, you've got to be, make sure you find out what you're talking about. Are we talking about Jerusalem, where David was at? Are we talking about the new Jerusalem? Is that what we're talking about, especially during the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or Hebrews 12, 22, the Bible says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. That's the holy city. That's a place called heaven. Uh, why did God do that? Well, first of all, because God had a chosen people. And he wants to identify with those chosen people. And so he identifies with Jerusalem. It's not New York City. And it's not Los Angeles or Dallas. Uh, but it's Jerusalem. And then we have that new Jerusalem. And because we can see the one city, we know what a city looks like. We know that we're going to have a city. And it defines and even gives the measurements of that city that's going to be uh, above the two. And then, so you kind of know that new Jerusalem is going to kind of be the hub in the will of heaven. Uh, we Many times we get caught up in saying things about heaven, and we're not wrong, but what we're really talking about, like streets of gold, we're talking about the new Jerusalem, which is kind of the hub of the will of heaven itself. So we have Zion uh, as the name of the literal Jerusalem. We have Jerusalem of the millennium, which is the new Jerusalem that comes down. And then we have the holy city, which we know is heaven, and the hub of that is in the center, which is the New Jerusalem. That's the way I've always looked at it, and uh, I don't think I'm incorrect on that. It's one of those things I've, I've spent some time looking at, but it's also, we see it's always in threes, and God has it set up, and I can kind of see the uh, progression of authority from the throne of David to the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ, the throne of God above. Uh, God always... Uh, delegates and establishes that authority. And we've spent time looking at that. And let's look at it. What does death mean to a Christian? I think this is good that we can spend a few minutes looking at it. I'm going to take, oh, not very much longer. But let me get into it a little bit. Absent from the body is at home with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8 says, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that, whilst we are at home in the, in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith. It's one of the real reasons I was thinking about going to the book of James. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Uh, the Lord's going to perfect this body one of these days. And the image of it is going to be as, as of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll deal with that at a later time. But what does death mean to the Christian? Well, death to the Christian means presence with God. I'm not talking, I'm talking about a literal presence. I'm talking about a walk up, touch the hands of Jesus' presence. I'm talking about the posture and profile of God. I'm talking about, listen, seeing the glory of God at the moment of death. That all of the fears and apprehensions that I had in this life are totally and completely dispelled. All pains, all suffering, all loss. It's all settled. At death, the soul is transported. Philippians 1, 23 and 24, the Bible says, For I am in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Desiring to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. What does death mean to a Christian? Well, it means that I'm transported into the presence of God. <coughs> Uh, in fact, if you look right there, Luke 16, 22, it's the last point I have there, if you can see it on the slide. 
The soul of Lazarus was transported by angels. The Bible says, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was buried, I mean carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Didn't say how he got across the bridge to the torment of hell. Now remember, until Jesus Christ applied his blood to the mercy seat, that uh, hell was divided. Uh, you had the Old Testament saints. Those who were saved, they were not in torment. They were in waiting. But they could see across the gulf. And those in a hell in torment could see across the gulf. And when Jesus, listen, died, he applied his blood to the mercy seat. He came down and took captivity that was captive in the holding place, those Old Testament saints, and he took them to heaven. And from then on, all those that are in hell are in torment, but it's kind of like me taking them over here to the jail because they haven't been judged yet. That's what the white throne judgment's all about. When we have our white throne judgment, then all of those Christ rejectors will be judged. They'll be cast into the eternal fire. That's what the Bible says. In other words, they go to the prison and never ends. We need to talk on these things, don't we? See, uh, pandemics and sickness and unsurety and, and, uh, dep and, and depravity and, uh, and false concepts and false doctrine, all those things, one of these days is going to be cleaned off the chalkboard. And I, I rest in these things. I don't know about you. But death to me, listen, no matter how I'm transported, hey, listen, whether it's one angel or a bunch of angels that have to carry me to be the Lord, whether it's the Lord himself, that I meet as soon as I, I pass away, which I think it's all going to happen in the, in the twinkling, of, in between the, the last breath and the first heavenly breath. As quick as I can breathe two breaths in this body, I think in two breaths I'm breathing celestial air. And if you want to hold on to something else, well, you better make sure it's the Bible. Uh, will we know one another in heaven? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. No, let's not. I think I'm at... I think I've, I've been over 30 minutes now, and I, we want to keep it when we get ready for this morning. But if you want to take the time to read 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 53, uh, we're going to talk about uh, being glorified in glorified bodies. And that's where we're going to pick up where we know one another in heaven. I'll start there in the next class. And uh, I appreciate again so much all your prayers. Um, I'm... Uh, I'm actually having a decent day today. Uh, still very fatigued. And uh, <clears throat> so I've had several people ask, and I don't mind telling. Uh, I had a, K a CT scan on Wednesday, and I still have a pneumonia in my left lung. And they, there was a little bit in my right lung. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm, my cough is getting better, and uh, I'm trying to move around a little bit more. Uh, and I'm trying to definitely be here, and I am so looking forward to Resurrection Sunday, and I'm praying and ask God to give me. Hey, listen, if I could just be at 75, 80 percent, I'd be tickled pink, and that's what I go with. And so uh, you pray that God will do that for me, and that we can have a, a, a we can get back to being and doing what we should be. Not necessarily because we were already doing it, because I I agree with Brother Shope. He said it many times that we come back different, and we ought to take advantage of that. So uh, Father, bless now as we close our Sunday school time. Uh, Lord, as we talk about heaven, as we see the reality of heaven and hell, as we see what we have in you through salvation, and that uh, one of these days we're going to see you face to face, and we will no longer depend on faith because grace will have transported us into your presence. And I don't understand it all, and it's hard to believe at times, but I know I have it. And I know your spirit dwells in me, and I know that I can trust the assurance of your word. Bless now, Father, in the service to come, we'll give you the praise and honor in Christ's name. Amen.